today on Family Talk. Well, welcome everyone to Family Talk, which of course is a division of the James Dobson Family Institute. I'm Dr. James Dobson, your host for this daily program. I want to tell you something. I want to tell you how much I appreciate you listening. You're you're being with us when you can. I know how busy everyone is, and thank you for joining us uh, for these programs. We feel so strongly about every single one of them, and we wouldn't be doing what we're doing if we didn't feel that they were extremely important for families. All of our radio programs are focused on strengthening and defending the family and promoting righteousness in the culture. Those are the two major objectives, and they have been passions of mine for more than 49 years. I was just counting it up. Uh, 49 years ago, I published Dare to Discipline, and that was the beginning of um, a ministry in itself. And of course, uh, from there, I've been trying to do what I could to defend the things that I believe. Uh, Right now, I'm extremely concerned that Christianity itself is under attack. It looks like every day the far left and satanic influences cook up something evil, something more than we have had to deal with in the past. The latest threat is gender confusion, which is being taught in some schools for children as young as five years of age. Kindergarten parents are either unaware of it or don't seem to care or too busy to notice. I don't know what it is, but they're willing to let their children be taught. Uh, For a five-year-old, the mechanics of changing the gender from male to female, boys to girls, and uh, hormone injections and other things. It is wicked. I'm telling you, it is wrong, it is evil, and I will fight it as long as I have breath in my body. I do hope you feel that way too. And you know, another Another concept that seems to be straight out of hell is this notion that masculinity, just manhood, the way it was designed and described in the scripture, that it is somehow toxic, dangerous, that children shouldn't be exposed to men because of this toxicity. And uh, that's also aimed straight at the institution of marriage. Um, it just everything that is moral and reasonable and the country has been based on it to this point is under attack at this time. Um, there is also some absolutely dangerous legislation being proposed in Washington. And uh, I must tell you about it. I don't have time today because we have other plans, but we'll talk about it in the next few days. The institution of the family is rocking and reeling like a ship on a stormy sea. And there are times when I feel like it may capsize. Uh, That's the urgency that I feel and why we're doing what we're doing. So the James Dobson Family Institute is in the heat of the battle, and frankly, we need your support to continue this fight, Uh, particularly right now. A caring donor uh, to this ministry is aware of our need, and he has provided a very generous gift to us to be used in a matching fund. Every dollar uh, someone else gives will be doubled for greater impact. It's because of you, our listeners, that we're able to accomplish the work that the Lord has called us to do. You can visit us at drjamesdobson.org or call toll-free 877-732-6825 for more information about the matching grant. Now let's get on to the show. You know, I've said many times that this next generation is the key to spiritual revival in this country. You know, there have been two great awakenings, and as I understand it, both of them started with younger people who began to pray for their country, and they saw uh, spiritual confusion there and began asking the Lord to bring a revival. Our hope is that uh, the millennials, who at this stage are confused themselves for the most part, will begin to recognize that something's going on that is dangerous and that our country is at stake. Unfortunately, young people today are being deceived by the lies of 
postmodernism and the rejecting Christianity. Uh, parents must engage their children on this front and teach them God's word early and help them understand who Jesus is and how he is our best friend. Today, you're going to hear an interview on this topic featuring my colleague and friend, Dr. Tim Clinton, and he has a couple of guests that you're going to want to hear from, Dr. Sean McDowell and J. Warner Wallace. And together, they're celebrated authors and apologists for the gospel and highly sought-after speakers. You're going to enjoy this program if I shut up and let you get to it. McDowell and Wallace co-authored a book that Dr. Tim Clinton is going to talk to them about. It's called, So the Next Generation Will Know, and it's intended to guide young people to the truths of Scripture. If you're a parent, you'll appreciate this resource and how you can implement their suggestions. I think uh, that you're going to enjoy this broadcast and learn a great deal from it. So here now is Dr. Tim Clinton to give you more information about today's guests on this edition of Family Talk. Hi, everyone. This is Dr. Tim Clinton. I am at the 2019 National Religious Broadcasters Convention. We're in Anaheim, California. Uh, with me today are two uh, amazing authors, Jay Warner Wallace and Sean McDowell. Uh, they've joined me today to talk about a brand new work they've done together called So the Next Generation Will Know. That's right. We're going to be talking about um, our kids, um, the next generation, God, what's happening with them, and how can we press in and help them to really understand and embrace truth uh, so they don't get lost. Uh, you two uh, are two of the best, I think, youth influencers and experts on Generation Z in the country. Uh, this is a brand new guide for anyone concerned about ensuring that that next generation, again, understands and embraces a biblical worldview. Sean, uh, Jim, thank you for taking time to sit down with us here at Family Talk. Oh, we're glad to be here. Honored awesome. to join you. Yeah. Hey, as we get started, you know, Dr. Dobson said to me recently, he said, Tim, they're trying to take away our kids. You know that? It's these devices that the kids have in their hands. Um, they're speaking in their life 24-7. Hmm. The church is battling to have influence. You know hmm. that? We're trying to figure out how to build our families in such a way that we stay connected, but it's a war zone. What are you guys seeing out there? Sean, what are you saying? Well, I have three kids. My son is 14, have a daughter who's 11, and a son who's six. And I do see the pressures that they're facing from their friends in light of this new digital generation to think differently, to act differently, to relate differently. And I think mm -hmm. it's overwhelming to a lot of parents. At times, it's been overwhelming to me. How do I put boundaries on this? How do I navigate this as a family? So if I'm thinking I come from a pretty awesome legacy and I'm wrestling with this stuff, I can imagine grandparents and parents are wrestling with this generation. So we did a ton of research on Gen Z mm -hmm. and clearly one of the key things is that they are truly a digitally native generation. Even millennials were kind of immigrants that smartphones arose while they were growing up. But this generation was swiping iPhones, swiping tablets well, before many guys. of them could yeah. read and even talk. I don't know that we've really processed how much this affects their relationships with people, relationship with God, their worldview, their behavior. It's like we're performing this social experiment on this generation without a lot of wisdom. I don't even know if you guys realize this, but one of the coaches in the NFL said that he will reorganize his meetings with his players so that every 20 minutes he will give them a social media break so they can leave the meetings and tend to their social media. I, I really? think what we're looking at serious. is, yeah, seriously, and, and of course this has been getting a lot of coverage, but the reality of it is, is we are in a new, era in which we can either say, well, we're going to we're going to deny it's happening. And I think Sean and I are both early adopters of this technology because we want to see, we want to put our feet in the same water as the young people we're teaching yeah. so we can understand how is this affecting us? How is it affecting the way we prioritize how we see ourselves? And also, I think we have to realize that this is changing, not just that you have another distraction, but it's also changing the way you process information, the, the, all the choices that young people have. Imagine a world in which there's this much noise. And it's available to us. You, you, you can't. Even, and this is why it's a distraction on social media, right? And why people are saying, "Well, why would football players like you know?" But again, it's such a part of our culture that we either have to learn how to navigate with it, 
So in the book, what we're trying to do is say, hey, here's where we are. Sean's done a wonderful job of collecting over the years uh, the data on Gen Z. For me, a lot of my experience was I train wrecked this as a youth pastor, right? I, I got saved in my late 30s, and then I was a cold case detective working as a youth pastor. I was bivocational. And the first year of students I graduated who were seniors left the church. By the time they were at Thanksgiving break in their freshman year at college, they already told their friends who were still in my ministry, yeah, we're done, we're out. So I realized whatever we were doing that first year, it was not passing on the Christian worldview to the next generation. So I, I knew we needed to change. And so a lot of the things we were sharing is Sean is a Christian educator, and we both speak to this audience is probably about 70% of our audience is young people. And we're saying, what, what are we learning and what have we train wrecked that we can help share? Sometimes wisdom comes from failures, but they don't have to be your failures. They could be our failures as long as we're able to communicate those to you. Hmm. I want to make sure we get across in the broadcast today um, how parents can really anchor their kids. Hmm. But before we go into that place, um, I think a lot of parents are getting a lot of things right. They Their intentions are really noble. I think they want to be close with their kids. I think they want them to grow up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. But the challenges today are radically different than they were even five, ten years ago. Yeah. Um, and like you said, these, what, what are the trends that maybe parents don't see? They do hear Kinnaman and others coming back saying, hey, we're losing them. When they go to college, they're leaving, you know, and we're w- hoping they come back. But what are we up against? I think when it's all said and done, it's a battle of worldviews and ideas. That's what we're in the middle of. Now, it's always been this way. Look at Ephesians, and he talks about we battle against flesh and blood, but now with excess on you know every single conceivable form of media just one click away kids are getting more messages non-stop all the time contrary to a christian worldview and it's a worldview crisis so the way we look at it and we frame the book is so the next generation will know is in a sense knowing the lord personally and experientially and there's two big challenges number one are all these ideas that are contrary But second, there's this relational brokenness. So it's no coincidence that around the time kids started getting smartphones in their hands around 2012, you see a hockey stick spike in loneliness and anxiety and depression. That's tied together. So really what we're at, if we wanna frame this, is it's a battle of ideas, it's a battle of truth, and it's also kids who are relationally disconnected and parents who are feeling helpless going, do I take their phone away? How do I set boundaries? What's my kid thinking? How do I even relate to this generation? Because the generation gap just mm. seems so big. And I think a lot of leaders, parents, grandparents, teachers feel lost how to bridge this gap. They don't know how to crawl into that. Pl- and into pass that, on the faith that, space. that you're right. talking about. Right. Well, this yeah. is a point at which both of us said, hey, this could be a book that's just a downer, right? We could, we could bang the drum say, this pay attention to what's happening. But this I, is I, a, I agree with you because, I mean, it would, it would scare people away. Yeah, I think this is a really a very optimistic book because this book is, okay, you know what is true about Christianity. How do you do this? How do you just teach this and pass this on? What does it look like for a parent, for a pastor, for a Christian educator? And when kids grow up, they... Uh, somewhere in maybe that 10 to 17 range, they begin to shift their focus from mom and dad to their peers, Mm -hmm. their friends, Mm -hmm. and that voice starts speaking into their life. The challenge we have is a whole novel level of competition uh, with the digital device, because they're hearing and they're trying to connect with everybody, you hear what I'm saying? And they're getting bombarded with all this messaging. Yes, let me say one thing that I've learned from Sean a lot of years ago before we wrote this book, is my kids have been in his high school where he was the teacher. So I got to sub once in a while when he was gone, yes, right? did. and I so realized that's not an easy job, okay? <laughs> Every time he asked me to sub, I was like, okay, I can do it, but man, it's gonna be a tough day. So what I've learned in this process is that, yes, it's, it's truth in the context of relationship. That is the most powerful so, ability that I will have to influence anyone. We are parents who have a relationship with our kids. Our noise will be more persuasive as long as we, number one, know what the truth is so we can communicate it, And number two, 
continue to build that relationship. D Sean, you got to tell him the story about when this is, I tell this story now all the time and it's not even my story, it's his story. <laughs> Come on, but <laughs> when he talks about when he first told his dad, a famous, world famous apologist. Josh McDowell. Josh McDowell, sure. that he was having doubts. I, you talk about it in the book, please share that. That's to me yeah. so powerful. Yeah, well, I, I'm assuming our audience is familiar with my dad and his work in apologetics primarily and relationships. I grew up thinking people weren't Christians because they had just not read more than a carpenter evidence demands verdict. Like, how hard is it? And all of a sudden, like a lot of kids, I'm 18, 19 years old. This is mid 90s. The internet was kind of taken off. And I have since learned that much of the secular blog began responding to my dad's book, Evidence, chapter by chapter. And I got online and I started reading. I don't even remember how I came across it. These doctors and lawyers and historians going chapter by chapter showing why they thought my dad was wrong. I just wasn't prepared for this kind of onslaught and it right. started making me feel like, oh my goodness, my parents mean well. What if what if the Bible's actually wrong? Jesus didn't rise from grave. Kind of a, a crisis in my life, so to speak, without over trying to overstate it. And I remember feeling like I just got to tell my dad that I don't know if I buy this Christian thing. So we were in Breckenridge, Colorado. And I asked him if we could go to coffee and, and I remember sitting down and I said something to the effect of, Dad, I wanna know what's true, but I just don't know that I'm convinced Christianity's true. Not knowing how he was gonna respond, being this influential apologist. And he didn't miss a beat. He looks at me and goes, son, I think that's great. And I'm like, did you hear anything that I just said? Because sometimes he's writing a talk in his head or something like that. And he goes, oh, I heard what you said. He goes, I've taught you to grow up and seek after truth. You can't believe just because my convictions, there comes a point you have to know what you believe and go for it. You know, I'll love you no matter what. That kind of speech he gave me as if he was prepared for it. And then years later, obviously I found, I don't even know that I left the faith, but I had just a lot of doubts and questions in the season figuring things out. Years later, probably two or three years ago, I said, dad, what were you really thinking when I told you about that? And my dad is a, a glass is half full, or actually he's like 98% full kind of person anyways. And he goes, I was confident that you would stay within the faith. And I said, why did you have so much confidence? He goes, because the depth of a relationship that you and I have. And I'll never forget that. In other words, he knew that how close we were. Yeah. I wasn't angry, wasn't rebelling. That would cause me to trust and draw me into the truth. That's what we're trying to do in the book, is we're saying relationships matter deeply. Well, think about that for a second. An apologist whose whole you know, language is truth It's language. a defense of the faith. I'm thinking, if you ask Josh McDowell, why were you so confident? He's going to say, because I knew it was true. I knew it was evidentially true. I know I can make a case for this. There's good reasons to know this is true. No, he didn't say any of that. He said it was the relationship. And that is so true. If you think about it, the, the, one of the primary indicators of what you will believe as an adult is what did your parents believe? Mm. So when you see in Europe, for example, that Islam is growing, it's because it's growing by birth rates. If you have 4.6 kids per couple, you are got a good chance of raising another generation of like-minded believers. This is still the most dominant reason why anyone believes anything mm. is if you ask Christians, why, why are you a Christian? The most popular answer is because my I was raised this way. Mm. Okay, so it comes down to, do we have the depth of relationship so that's a big part of it. Now, it's not all of it. It's the truth. It's, it, it's not an either or. It's a both and. Speak to the mom and dad who right now, they're turning up the dial because they're estranged in their relationship with mm -hmm. their son or daughter, or they're terrified. They mm -hmm. feel like they're losing him. What do we do at this particular moment? First thing I'm going to say is you are not alone. But then also realize you're probably making more of a difference than you realize. They're watching everything you do. We are really good as parents in offering what is true. This is what we think, we, we study scripture, we know scripture, and Sean has written about this with his dad in the past, but I just wanna solidify it to make it simple. Two whys for every what. It, stop just giving your kids what is true, because trust me, the world around them is giving them the other two, the other two parts of this, which are the two whys. Number one, why is it true? And they don't think we can answer that question. They think that the other views have good answers in those, but they oh, don't yeah. think that we have any answers. Oh, yeah. So we have to offer the first why, why is it true? And here's the second, it's, just, it's, it's probably maybe it's even more important. Why should I care? So what? It's the so what question. You know, I think one of the biggest things we see, and we take young people to Berkeley on missions trips, we talk about this in the book, 
and how to do this kind of thing. We take them to Berkeley for four or five days and we put them in the face of people. And it's not like they're getting a lot of angry atheists. What we're seeing is a rise of apathyism. You know, it's a different, it's a different a challenge than atheism. It's this, the rise of apathy. Why should I care? Why does it matter to me? So what I want for all of, of, as a parent now is if I could do it all over again, I would never give a what without the two whys. In, um, so the next generation will know you guys um, really try to help parents teach worldview, right? Mm -hmm. Isn't that really what you're doing? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're trying right. to, to give them those core fundamentals so they can give it to their kids mm -hmm. in a meaningful way so it's answering, asking and answering those questions. That's, That's right. right. That's right. So stay in the context of relationship. How do I go about doing this so that they don't feel like I'm just preaching at them, I'm just yep. downloading on them? Sean, how do I how do we get beyond that? Because there's almost like a repulsion that question. gets repulsive at yeah. times, you know, mm -hmm. with our kids. I have made plenty of those mistakes where I've tried too hard. My kids are like, Dad, I get it back way. I'm like, okay, made a mistake, learn from it and move on. But I'd much rather have parents try too hard and have to step back than just let it go and not try hard. So what we're saying in this book is we're not adding some new program you have to do. Let's take what you're already doing and make it more effective. So instead of preaching at a kid and telling him, here's what you need to believe, just ask good questions. That's what Jesus did. This is how Paul writes Romans. He asks questions and then he responds. So at the dinner table, you're going to have dinner together, hopefully. If not, start carving out that time regularly. Now at the dinner table, we spend probably too much time talking about basketball and volleyball and school, like it's sometimes I think our lives are consumed by this, but I am very intentionally looking for opportunities to have spiritual conversations. And rather than preaching at my kids, just asking them a question. And more often than not, if it's a good question, if it's interesting, they're actually willing to engage. The opportunities are already there. You don't have to add this new program. Just start paying attention to different things and you have tools already in front of you to do this with your kids. I'm thinking about the statement, in our lives first, or you can't give what you don't have. Mm -hmm. A lot of parents would say, but I, um, I don't know, I don't feel prepared. You know, that I wanna have conversations. You're, what I hear you saying is, listen, start having them. You yeah, know that? yeah. Uh, be pressing in on yourself. I mean, build uh, awareness, understanding, uh, anchor yourself in truth. Yes. Make sure you understand your own worldview. You hear what I'm saying? Yeah. And then at the same time, in the context of relationship, you don't just drop in these these moments. You don't force these in on your kids. No, You're no. looking for those That's right. That's right. moments that they just appear. That's right. And I'm it's, afraid we haven't been he, sensitive to those things Because, in the past. you know, Tornier yeah. used to say this. Paul Tornier used to say, the busy, preoccupied parent misses many a cue. That's right. Or moment to speak into his son or daughter's life. That's what you're talking about. Be That's ready. Right. And here's the key though. When it, if the parent feels like, I don't know how to ask these good questions. I don't understand these worldview issues. When it comes to doubt, some of the most important research shows that it's not doubt itself that wrecks a kid's faith. It's unexpressed doubt. Hmm. In other words, just being willing to say, tell me what you think. So don't be overwhelmed by oh it. Oh my goodness, right. sometimes it's, my... It's, it's, see, this is a, a beautiful moment. That's okay, yeah. and if you don't know, just say, I'll get back I, to you. <laughs> I don't know, let me think about this. It's creating conversation, creating space. Every parent can just ask questions and listen. That's a spiritual worldview conversation that over time makes a difference in the life of a young person. But I gotta tell you, I, I'm just gonna press hard on this one issue. We have committed headspace to a lot of things that if our job was simply to defend the Lakers to our kids, wow, we would be ready to answer any question so that true. they ask. Okay. So, so we, we do know that this is going to require us kind of reorganizing our thoughts and our commitments, because I will tell you, I, I, unfortunately I can have very robust conversations about sports. And if that's all I can do with my kids, I probably have not passed on. I've passed on my fanship, my sports legacy of as a fan to my kids, yeah, yeah. but I haven't passed on the Christian worldview. So I, I, I think it's true when parents say, I'm not sure I can answer that question. Well, okay. I know there's a lot of questions you could answer, though, that probably aren't as important. So it's going to mean we're going to have to reprioritize a little bit. I don't want to sound like I'm being too harsh about that, but it will require a recommitment. But what, a, what an opportunity. What accountability should be ours? 
because God's given those kids to us for a, for a season. That's right. I know we're forever parents, but there are moments hmm. we don't want to miss those moments. So the next generation will know. It's their new book. Uh, Jim Wallace, Sean McDowell, you guys, thank you. Final word from both of you real quick. Don't be overwhelmed. This is this can seem intimidating, okay? This is God working through us. Don't be overwhelmed. You can do this. Remember, someone has passed on the faith to you. Let's turn and do likewise for the next generation. Thanks for joining us, you guys. Thanks for having us. This is Roger Marsh, and you've been listening to Dr. James Dobson's Family Talk. Dr. Tim Clinton has been our host today, joined by apologists Dr. Sean McDowell and also author J. Warner Wallace. You can learn more about their book, So the Next Generation Will Know, by visiting today's broadcast page at drjamesdobson.org. There you'll find information about their individual ministries and other notable work from these two guys as well. Go now to drjamesdobson.org and then click onto the Broadcast tab at the top of the page for all that information. Well, that's all the time we have for this week here on Family Talk. Be sure to join us again Monday for another insightful broadcast. I'm Roger Marsh. Thanks so much for listening and have a blessed weekend. This has been a presentation of the Dr. James Dobson Family Institute.